Okay, so hi everybody. Um, I think we'll uh, start off with the preamble now and get things going. So uh, hi, thanks for joining. I uh, hope everybody is safe and well. Uh, my name's Adam Fairclough and I'm the Customer Success Manager here at Elm Tech and we are the uh, exclusive um, distribution partner for SketchUp in the UK. So my job is to help SketchUp users get the most out of SketchUp and its extensions, of course. Enscape is one of those. So that is the topic of today's uh, today's webinar, um, which is to help you work with materials within Enscape. So before we kick off, um, I suppose I'll just let you all know you're all on mute at the moment. Um, just so I can hear myself thinking, I've got a lot to, <laughs> lot to get through. Um, if you've got questions, feel free to type them in the questions section at the side. I've got colleagues who are online as well, and they may be able to answer them for you for me. Um, if not, we're going to have a Q&A session at the end of the main presentation, which I reckon will be mm, 45 minutes to an hour if uh, if all goes well. So all the normal rules of the real life, um, <laughs> the real life, the, the webinar world uh, apply to this. So please excuse um, any doorbells ringing, any cats attacking me, crawling on my keyboard. Um, any of these things that can happen, most likely something crashing. Um, so uh, it's there. Also, just for reference, the video will be recorded and we will have this on our YouTube channel. So if you do need to dash off at a, at a later time, don't worry, you can pick up and watch the rest of it later. So let's uh, head on through. And let's get started. So, I mean, if you're not familiar with, with Enscape, uh, Enscape is a real-time renderer. And if you're not familiar with what a real-time renderer is, that means that we can make changes to our geometry, to our lighting, to our materials, and we can see those changes happen instantaneously in real time. Enscape is really great for producing see very high quality still images, but also particularly good at doing video and VR and panoramas and, and all these other good things too. So this is how today's um, agenda looks. Agenda is a very office word, I suppose, um, but hey, we've got to pretend we're, uh, we're working proper, haven't we? So it's uh, going to start off with a, a simple keyword workflow with an Enscape. So this is a good place to start if you've not really ventured into the world of materials in Enscape. We're going to move on to uh, a manual material parameter section where we look at how we can take control of those in a little bit more detail. And then we go off and have a look at uh, PBR material maps and the power of kind of height maps and roughness maps and how we can really add another layer of realism to our models. So keyword workflow. We'll head into a model in just a second. Um, essentially, um, Enscape will look for keywords within the material name within SketchUp. So if it sees any of these words in here, it's going to start applying some parameters to the material. So let's um, just head into my actual SketchUp model. There we go. It's all ready to go. Let's get that set up. I'm just going to close my windows so I can see what I'm looking at. Perfect. I'm going to shuffle, get comfortable, and we'll start to have a look. So here we are. So just you may want to make the window full screen as we're watching today, as there is uh, multi multiple things going on so I can work all at the same time. So let's just have a look at a few things. Generally, uh, I'm just going to be using the eyedropper tool, which is just over here. And I'm going to have a look at this material here. I just need to close Microsoft Teams down because it is probably lipping over you right now. There we go. Let's have a look at this here. So um, over here, we've got some glass materials. Basically, along the top, we're going to see the materials in their default form, and then the bottom we're going to see them with the, with the um, parameters applied. So we're going to start with glass. This is a bit of an easy one because most of the SketchUp materials themselves have glass in the title. So these have already started off being glass, but we can see how we can make some really basic changes directly within SketchUp itself. So if I just hit my edit material button here, we can do some really basic stuff like increasing the opacity of the glass. Let's just zoom in a bit further for you there. And we can see actually what is sort of defined as glass within the rendering. We can see that we've got a very sharp, clear reflection. Obviously, the material's transparent. We've got a little bit of bending of light, reflect, I can't talk, 
refraction at the edge here and this is creating this kind of double wall effect as well. So this is roughly how Enscape uh, renders glass and in fact Enscape will actually pick up opacity on any material and define it as glass. So if you've got anything that has opacity applied, Enscape will assume it is glass. So just beware if you've got uh, any net curtains or anything that you've applied opacity to because they will start to show up in glass in Enscape. But we can see we can turn off the glass actually. So let's move along to another, another keyword which isn't predefined. Uh, we've got mirror and chrome. So mirror and chrome both do the same thing. If I grab that material, is it? Sorry, I've got such a big cursor for your benefit that I keep missing it. Um, and if I simply type mirror into the keyword, uh, into the material name, we can see how Enscape will now apply a couple of rendering parameters to that material. Uh, in this case, it's made it metal and it's made it very highly reflective. No roughness at all. Mirror and Chrome are two keywords that you can use anywhere in the name of the material and that will behave in the same way. So we can see we can have a really big change very, very quickly. If we move along to another material, metal. That's sorry, I'm just gonna I've lost my uh, ability to do anything. Uh-oh, it's all going wrong, guys. <laughs> sorry, there we are. <laughs> Let's have a look at metal. Metal just here. If we use the keyword metal anywhere in this material, it's going to apply another set of rendering parameters. So metal, steel, copper, aluminium, these parameters are all going to do the same thing. And what we can see is Enscape has applied a metal parameter to make it have the reflect well, the reflective parameters of metal, but also we've got a slightly more diffuse reflection compared to the mirror there. The keyword's there. Steel, copper, aluminium, there's probably some other hidden ones as well. Just bear in mind that this only changes the changes it to a metal. It won't, if you choose copper, it won't change the colour of that. We can change the base colour of our material and that will have an impact on how our metal actually looks within Enscape. So primarily controlling these within within SketchUp itself. We'll move along to the next keyword, and I've just got an example here of something with some texture. That's a, a wood texture there. And there are two variations on this. We've got polished and acryl, and then clear coat and car paint, which are similar things. So what this will do, if I uh, use the keyword polished here, this is gonna apply a lacquer or a kind of uh, varnish-like finish. So this, this is a little bit different to some of the other ones, as we actually have a secondary clear coat that sits on top of our colour or on top of our material. And this can be really beneficial if you're wanting to create that, create that varnish effect. Um, if we turn off the texture and we apply some other colours, we can maybe see how we might be able to use that for an enamel paint or something like that. So the clear coat and car paint variations do something a little bit differently. These are primarily set up for producing well, car paint and this will produce a metallic paint effect. I was trying to think of things um, in an interior situation that might be that kind of paint and I was uh, a bit stumped. So all I could think of was maybe like an espresso machine or uh, a kitchen aid or something. But again, useful, useful tags to know about. Just undo those and I'm back to wood. Let's move across to our, I have to keep doing this, sorry. It's not canceling my moves. If we move across to ceramic, uh, in fact, we'll do all of these three together. We'll look at cer ceramic, marble, and plastic. If we apply um, the ceramic key tag, or keyword, sorry, to the material here, we can see that we've now got a reflective surface that's slightly more diffuse. And this is something we can use on lots of materials. I wouldn't get too hung up on the fact it's called ceramic because um, there are many other things that you, you'll be using which are um, equally as reflective. I'm going to have to bring back my uh, large tool set because it's really irking me, this. Right. I'm presuming you can see everything okay because I'm getting a little bit of delay in certain things. My computer's having to do it really hard to be able to render and uh, do some recording and some other things all at the same time. Let's have a look at the marble key tag. Um, this here um, will apply another parameter, and this is one that you can use lots. 
you can see that this is a slightly more diffuse reflection. Yet again, if I change the time of day and change the lighting a little bit, I might be able to see it a little bit better. We've still got a smoother surface, but slightly rougher than the ceramic material there. Let's have a look at plastic. Plastic is, again, slightly more rough again, but we can see that there. We can see that there's a difference between the original material before we applied it and after. And then we'll just move on to the last kind of core tag, and this is the fabric tag. This is going to be a very, uh, very subtle one, actually, um, as it is a very rough, rough material. So the default material isn't particularly uh, shiny to begin with. So, sorry, it's fabric. So we can use the keyword fabric or cloth for this. We'll talk more about this later on and how we can, can use it. Um, again, probably can't really see a difference between the two there, but um, by default, everything that comes into Enscape is very, very rough, um, which means that a lot of things almost have the appearance of, of fabric. And this is part of the reason why we can probably do a lot better um, just by doing some pretty straightforward things with, with these tag parameters. So you can see here that the, the balls at the top there don't really look like anything in particular. They're kind of unreal. I guess they're levitating, which doesn't help with that. But um, we can see how these uh, materials that do have some kind of shine generally will start to look as if they, they belong in our world. So let's apply these to, um, actually, to an interior that we have here. So I've got a tree in the way that's randomly appeared. Um, let's head down to this and just have a look at some of these tags on something a little bit more interior focused. And let's grab this one here. So we can just see how we can really quickly use these. I'm going to make this elephant here ceramic. You can see it's now reflecting things from around us. We can do the same with the elephant, or we can maybe make him uh, metal. Uh, what else have we got? We've got, again, some other metal objects in the background. We can see we've used a gold material straight from SketchUp. Let's just pop metal onto that one as well. We've now got a gold metal. This one here, we'll do the same for that as well. I suppose that could almost be terracotta, so maybe we could we could leave that as it is, or we could try, we'll try plastic, something like that. So we can see that we're just changing the materials very quickly. We'll use marble for, I spell marble, not marble. We'll use marble for the marble there. And we'll just use a couple of other tags that we've not talked about. So first off, let's just have a look at the top surface of this mobile phone here. So I'm just going to grab the colour or the texture that's on there, which is just a phone screen texture. Here's a tag called Emissive, which is, I can never spell, but it's one M and two S's. Emissive, and that will produce a small glow on the screen. If I make it a little bit darker, you can see it's starting to glow a little bit there. Just a little one we can do to add a little bit of extra, extra realism. So let's have a look at these plants here. Um, so the plants, there's a couple of unique tags for these here. Let's grab this leaf, there we are. Um, so we can see that we've obviously got a backlit image here and there's light shining towards us. And if we go around to the other side of this leaf, we can see that it is illuminated on this side. We've got light and we've got shadow, but on the other side, nothing at all. Um, there is a tag that can help us with that that's designed for leaves and we can use the tag foliage or vegetation or leaf. And I've got a feeling this won't work because I have broken my model by changing things. Let me just turn this on manually and we'll come to this. The foliage tag here basically means that through the model or through this single face, that light can now pass. So it makes quite a big difference to, to that plant there. Adds something a little bit more realistic. We can actually use that same tag on other things, which we will talk about later. So that's uh, foliage. Let's just show you a couple of other hidden ones. Uh, we've got uh, just some scene here. We can use the word grass or long grass or short grass. And Enscape will render some animated grass that blows in the wind. If we grab the water here and I name that one water, we can generate a, an animated water surface too. And I suppose I probably should have shown you something that's quite similar to uh, grass. And that is, in fact, carpet. So if we grab 
the carpet rug, or the rug that's there. And this is actually a texture of a rug uh, rather than just a solid color. And if I use the keyword on this example, short carpet, there's long carpet as well, it will actually render some carpet fibers. They're quite thick and they eat into the floor a bit, um, but we can kind of see the type of effect that it has there. So that is a really basic run through of simple keywords and how we can make some very quick changes to our model. And we're going to head over into another model in just a second. So that's just another emissive tag there. So there we go. That's that's the simple simple keywords. Any questions you have about that? Again, uh, pop them into the questions down there, and we'll come to them afterwards. And we're going to go into part two, which is looking at the manually. So I'm just going to load up a file, and whilst that is loading, which I'm not sure if it is. Mm -hmm -hmm. Nope. Let's go and have a look at uh, some slides. Okay. So yes, this is uh, to paraphrase uh, somebody who I read about online who is uh, a graphics engineer who's designed a lot of the algorithms that are used for 3D rendering, both um, in ArchViz in video games, in movies, um, he's, he sort of has a mantra of everything is shiny. And this is kind of a bit of a good example of this. We're going to be going into this model shortly, but we can see this is um, a, a, an Enscape model. Essentially, if we've just pressed the, the play button in SketchUp and gone straight into Enscape, we can see roughly how this model would look. As I mentioned before, Enscape treats everything by default as having a very rough, diffuse surface, which is in this uh, in this example, it's given us OK results. The clever stuff that Enscape does in terms of rendering light bouncing around the video, uh, around the image and around the world has done what it needs to do. But um, there's something off about this. There's something that maybe doesn't look, look quite right. Um, and just as an example, I took every material in the model and I made it uh, half as rough. I made it similar roughness to, to plastic, actually. Uh, or the plastic example that I showed you in, in the, the earlier thing. As I said, don't get too hung up on the names, Just we're just thinking about whether something's rough, rough or smooth. And we can see here that now light is able to bounce off the floor in particular. We've got reflections of other parts of our environment, of our space, shadows where there weren't shadows before because light can bounce off and uh, in interact with other parts of the model, shiny bits on the ceiling. Um, and this is I'd imagine, and hopefully you agree, probably looks a little bit closer to reality than our first example, which looked comparatively flat. And I'd encourage you to have a look around the world, you know, have a look at the world around you and you know, look, where can you see reflections? Where can you see light bouncing? Um, I started doing it for the last few weeks, actually, as I've been thinking more about it for this webinar. Um, and now I'm just keep doing weird double takes on, on my um, kitchen tiles and stuff. So we're going to have a look at the material parameters shortly. Primarily what we were adjusting um, just now was whether something has a very clear, smooth surface or whether something has a very uh, micro faceted uh, rough surface. And essentially the reason that we see a reflection is because light rays hit the surface of, of an object and then bounce off in a very predictable way and we get a very crisp, clear reflection. And if the surface itself has micro abrasions on it, which everything does to some extent, then light actually hits and it scatters and we start to have a more diffuse reflection. So at the very, very extreme end of things, we've got still got light bouncing off, but it's just scattering in every direction. So we no longer see, uh, easily see a reflection. There's still light bouncing off it, just not towards our eyes always. Um, and there are some just examples here of kind of where some real life materials might fit in on this scale. I think most of this will be fairly self-explanatory <laughs> in that we know that a very reflective surface is going to be very smooth and something like a plaster surface is going to be um, on the rough end of the scale. But it's quite unusual for something to be 100% rough. And we're going to show this as some examples just now. So I'm hoping this has all loaded up. Yes, brilliant. Uh, so we're in the same model, so it's a little bit grainier than it normally would be, just because um, the computer is working hard. Um, 
but we're going to have a look at some uh, material parameter adjustments. I'm just going to hop over to an object that we have set up here. So this is just an abstract object that we can use to demo um, manual material changes. Now I'm just going to hit this up here, the Enscape Materials button, which is uh, if you've not got the toolbar, you just right click and turn on uh, Enscape. I can't, <laughs> my brain doesn't work for alphabets. There we go. Enscape, it's just there and we're going to get a window just like this. So we're going to be having a look at these just now. Uh, but basically, we've got all of the materials that exist within our current model. So we can we can search for something by name if you're uh, well organized and have named things, or we can just do what we've been doing previously and using the eyedropper tool and just targeting a particular color. So at the moment, we're just at the default Enscape 90% roughness. Now we've got a scale here. This is what we're going to be looking at, reflect the reflection section. I'll turn that one off as well. We've got, I'm going to make that a little bit darker also. So we can do some stuff like cha changing the color uh, of the material here. That is synced up with SketchUp. So if I click off, it'll change there too. Um, we have a scale of zero to 100% in, in roughness. Just to give you some examples there, the glass and mirror materials that we looked at were around about 0% or 0%. The uh, ceramic material that we looked at is around about 10% and we can see this again changing here. The marble material is somewhere around about 30% and we can start to see that changing there. The plastic material that I applied both to that image and to the plastic ball on the keyword section is around about here and we can see it starting to fade away. And then our fabric that we had as an option is around about 80%. And we can now see that it's starting to become um, almost duller in colour because the light is hitting it and, and scattering away in every direction. We've got some other optical things happening with this. So we can control quite a lot about our image simply by using this roughness slider. And what we would say is that generally things are going to be in maybe that first or sort of 75% of, of roughness. Most, most objects will be. And we'll go through and use some examples uh, of things throughout the model in just a second. The other one that we will be changing quite frequently is the metallic slider. And this has two choices to choose from, really. It has a whole, whole scale, but basically something is metallic or it is, uh, sorry, it is metallic, <laughs> or it is not. Um, there's pretty much just, just two types of materials that exist in the world. There are some exceptions to this. If we have time in the questions and somebody wants to see some exceptions, um, we can do that, but we won't talk about that just now. So let's go and go back to the model and just look at maybe some strategies for making large changes. So I think as we saw from that first example, there are certain things within the model that we, we could possibly focus on. I think the most obvious ones are going to be any large surfaces that exist within your model. So let's take a look at the floor as the most obvious one. Floors, ceilings, walls are going to be the ones that we look at straight away. You can see I've um, just tagged the floor there and this has actually got a, a texture applied to it. Because it's got a texture applied to it, I've also got an option now to be able to fade out that image to, to a plain colour. So if I wanted to fade it out to a white colour, I can kind of mix the texture image with with a color if I wish, but we'll leave it just as a texture at the moment. 90% roughness is quite unlikely for a floor. That would be um, very, 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 very fine. Um, and that's probably not typical of a, of a high wear, <laughs> high wear floor. Um, if we head over right to super shiny, let's come down so we can see a little bit easier. We can see we've got this really cool shiny floor. It looks really great. It's it's basically a black mirror at this point. Um, again, probably not going to exist, but we can see as we come back just a little bit, we can start to look at a ceramic floor. We're able to start seeing seeing reflections change, and we're just going to essentially eyeball this as to somewhere that we feel is appropriate for the material that we're using. So we can see this is a kind of stony material. And I think the examples we gave you for ceramic and, and marble should give us an idea that we might want this somewhere between sort of 10 and 20%, depending on how shiny we want it to be. So I'm going to just drop it. We'll go for maybe 21%, something like that. So we can see we've made quite a big impact to our model already, and it'll just settle down if I let it go still, and it'll just carry on calculating the beams of light as I'm moving. 
And let's have a look at some other components within the model. So we could look at um, these chairs, for example, which we could see actually sitting in front of that reflective floor. Now, if we have a look at these, we can see, uh, let's have a look at the yellow one. We can see they're very, very diffuse. And if you've seen those type of chairs, you'll know that they're either enamel painted or I guess sometimes they are bare metal with an enamel paint. So we could use that clear coat option or we could simply make these more reflective. And you can see as I've approached even like, well, even at sort of 65%, we can start to see these starting to sit within our model, looking more realistic as they're actually starting to catch the light on the top of them. We're actually getting reflections now. Let's have a look at the red one, which looks really, um, really uh, matte by comparison. We increase the roughness down to zero. We can see that we've got some reflections. Now we could even look at using that clear coat option that we talked about. So we can use keywords for it or we can actually select it manually. I'm gonna select it manually and we have the same kinds of options. Is it a metallic? It's not in this case. Is it non-metallic? So I'm gonna set it to zero and then I can choose the level of roughness that I want to apply to that material. So we can see straight away those, those materials probably would match, but let's do that because it's annoying me. There we go. We can see how those already are starting to fit in with our model, starting to look um, a little bit more real. So that is roughly those materials. Let's head over to a little scene over here and let's just tackle a few other ones. So again, everything here currently is at uh, the default 90% roughness. And we've, if we have a look at, uh, we've already had a look at just basically changing materials. I'm going to apply a bit more gloss to to this vase, maybe a little bit less, we'll do around about there. Let's have a look at the other side, we've got a black material. Um, let's, let's make this one a metallic surface and let's do it somewhere, somewhere around there. So we, we've got a mixture of materials now. We can have a look at this white pot here and let's have a look at the transparency option. So we've got an option to manually control the glass and that is triggered, um, if it's not already, triggered by hitting transparency. And there are a few parameters here. So first of all, let's have a look at the roughness. It's set at having a very rough external surface, which isn't typical for the glass. So let's just come backwards. There's also a little bug there involved in that. So I'm gonna make it a shiny glass here. And we can also adjust our opacity, the same as we did in that initial keyword section. So I'm going to make that a little bit more transparent and let it just settle down. We can see it's exhibiting the properties of glass. We've got an option here for tint colour, so we could maybe make it the kind of medicine jar, kind of 70s smoky colour there. And we have another parameter here for refractive index, so let me just show you that one. I think we talked about how it's bending the light as, thing, as, as we look through it. We can reduce that option. It's set on 1.5, which is broadly where most glass materials will be. Um, but if you're finding that that doesn't look quite right for you, because it does create a sort of double wall effect sometimes, you could decrease that just to make it look what's uh, appropriate for you. So we'll go with that one there. We also have another option there for frosted glass. We tick that one. What this one will do is actually, this is attached now to the roughness. If I increase the roughness, not that too far, it will actually start to blur as we look through it. So we can make some, again, some very quick changes to a setup, um, but have a lot of control over how, how things look. So again, talking about quick wins, I think we're sitting on this table. This table here is actually a wooden texture. Um, we could, do a couple of things to it. We could increase or decrease the roughness, make it shinier. And that kind of looks like it has been very highly polished now. But we could also look at that clear coat option as well for this, because again, this might have a very thick layer of a varnish or a French polish or something. So we still got the same kind of options that we have for, for clear coat. We were able to adjust the roughness of the material that sits underneath the lacquer. And we can see that again, we've, we, with those additional reflections, now we're starting to get something that looks perhaps a little bit more like it would do in real life. 
So let's look at some other bits going on. We've got a metal material on the MacBook here. Let's uh, move across to it. Oh, sorry, it's going jerky again. Let's grab uh, the metal. Now we can see actually this model has come from 3D Warehouse and it's actually textured with um, a like a kind of noisy, a noisy texture there. I don't know if you can see that. It's this texture here. Now we could leave that there or we could just remove it. I'm going to remove it. And at the moment we are on a, a metal, metal surface. Again, we could see a metal which is going to behave like a, a mirror. In this case, a grey mirror, and then we could have it as a red mirror if we wanted, but um, let's keep it on that kind of grey colour. And then we can increase the roughness to give it that kind of um, that frosted, frosted metal type finish that uh, a premium laptop will have. Worth noting, as we're changing these, we can change the lighting in Enscape, or the natural lighting if you've got sun coming in. So you can do this by holding shift and clicking the right mouse button and dragging it, and it will change the time of day. It depends a little bit on what you're planning on doing with your model, whether you are um, aiming to just produce static shots, in which case you may have already set your, your sun position and your lighting up, or if you are um, planning on using video or VR and you're maybe ch planning on changing the lighting conditions a little bit more, uh, it's worth just flicking between night and day because it would just give us a bit of an indication as to how those materials look in, in different lighting conditions. Um, occasionally it's possible to create something that looks okay in the daytime but maybe looks a little bit weird in, in, the, in the nighttime. And I think this looks okay at the moment. So let's make it a little bit lighter and let's look at a couple of other parameters. So we're going to click uh, on the laptop screen as an example of something else we can do. So we talked about the emissive tag very briefly that we can use. We can use the self-illumination option and this will actually cause any material, whether it's a texture or a plain colour, to glow. And we now have an extra option here. I've just had a warning telling me my audio is cut out. Oh, I just had a warning telling you, <laughs> telling me my audio is cut out. I'm hoping you can hear me again. Hopefully that's all okay. If I could have a sign from one of my team members, that would be great. Uh, I will carry on. I'm assuming that it's all good. Um, where was I? Sorry. Having a look at the, the computer screen here. Um, we've got another option that's appeared when we tick that self-illumination box, and that is to control the luminance. And this is the intensity of the light that's being emitted. Um, just for reference, a computer screen is around about two to three hundred candelas per square meter, which is what that is there. So I'm going to apply that to that screen. I'm going to get my lights back on again. And there's some other you know, useful ways that we can use that self-illumination um, parameter screens. Um, we'll come to some others in just a sec. Another nice thing you can actually do in Enscape, and again, this depends on whether it's uh, whether you're planning on doing videos or, or VR outputs, but you can actually load a video and use that as a texture. So if I find, I've got one there. I've got a little video clip of my fam fam famous, my favourite film there. And again, this still works with the self-illumination so we can see it, see it glowing, see it moving as we move around our model. So that's just a nice little thing we can do. But let's look at some other quick wins, some little tips we can use to improve our model. So I've got these decorative light bulbs up here. Uh, in this particular model, I've not got any lights actually placed in the model. And even if I did, I probably wouldn't be placing any lights for these, um, for these light bulbs because they're I'd say primarily um, decorative in the scheme of things. Now I have been organized enough and I've actually got a material called filament which is applied to those. You should probably just about see it. It's a yellow material. It's there. Uh, if it was green, you see it there. Okay, so I'm going to use self-illumination on, on that one and we can see that those are now glowing. They're probably a little bit intense in brightness. I'm, I am going to bring those back a little bit. Generally, when I'm using the self-illumination option, I will go as low as I can 
while still getting the effect that I want. So I'd say round about there. Other kind of references, actual, if you're actually creating an actual light bulb, uh, like a full, fully bright LED one or something, that those are somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 uh, candelas per square meter. I've actually done this up here on the spotlights. There's no actual spotlights placed, but the light sources where, the, where I will be placing the, the lights often look better if they've actually got some kind of glow, particularly if you've got recessed lights. It looks weird if you've got your up lighters and your down lighters and other things, but there's no actual place that, that light seems to be coming from. So I've just applied that to the surface of those so it kind of looks okay. That self-illumination option can be used in a few other places. I'll give you an example here. If you're doing kitchens or interiors, another nice place that you can do it is I'll have a look at the model, depends where it's come from or how it's been modelled, but quite often from 3D Warehouse people have used little photo textures and things for things like buttons, and if I apply the self-illumination to those, I'm going to turn it right down, we can now see that if I happen to be using a darker lighting setup, they now glow, and that's nice. So, so yeah, lots of, lots of places, I can do these endlessly. Light boxes, another good kind of place that they can be used. So those menus up, up there, I could do that. Uh, turn that down again, it's too bright. But we can see we can make some fairly big changes quite quickly just by going around changing the reflectivity of different materials, making them emit light, making them transparent and having full control over that. So just to head over to how am I doing for time? I think we're okay. Just to head over here, let's have a look at a couple of other parameters. Um, I think we talked about the foliage and the vegetation parameter that we can use for tags. We can use that in other situations. So uh, I will actually use this on this curtain here. So we've also got the light shining through, but um, depends on whether your curtain's a blackout curtain, but perhaps you, yeah, you're going for something that's a little bit finer. Uh, or you've got some bright sunlight behind that you do kind of want to have uh, an influence on it. I'm going to use the foliage tag on that um, on that curtain and that just now allows light and shadows to interact with it and sort of transfer to the other side of the material uh, and this will work for both direct sunlight or artificial artificial lights as well so if you've got an artificial light placed which I have which you can't see um, that will also cast a shadow um, so if you haven't guessed of who it is just sitting there, I know I'm about a month behind, but it's Bernie. So we've got a couple of other ones that we've already seen these working, but let's just show the manual parameters for them. We've got the, the water here, and we showed how we could turn, turn that on. If we look at the water option, we've got a few options to uh, change the into a bloody murder bath or uh, a beautiful turquoise uh, tropical sea. We've got options to be able to override the settings of the wind that exists within our world. So by default, it will it will blow along. We can make it windier so water moves faster. Or in the case of maybe an interior, maybe you don't want it, really want it to move at all. Um, so we can just really slow it down. We can change the direction of the wind. We can change the size of our waves. Oh, it's going slow in different ways, the scale of them. And then again, really nice one, caustics intensity. So if you're not familiar with caustics, that is, I'm gonna to have to make them bigger to make them show up. Where are they? Those are the little reflections that you get at the, the bottom of a, of a pool. Uh, and that allows you to turn those up or on, make those more obvious, less obvious. So I think that is the majority of the different options that we have within Enscape for changing parameters manually. Uh, just double check there. I think as you said, I would be tackling, if I ever look at, look at a model, tackle those big surfaces, tackle the floor, I'd probably look at these, floor, these wood bits here, the ceilings, anything that you know in the model that is shiny. So that fridge, for example, I think I've already done it. Um, Anything that you know is shiny is a really good place to start and start working backwards from that. So let's have a look at part three, um, which is uh, working with PBR materials. So here we go. So 
So I'm just going to put these on screen. We'll send you some stuff out uh, by email afterwards, uh, which will talk uh, about where we can get some of these links. But these are these are some resources online for being able to go and get physically based materials. If you're not familiar with physically based materials, uh, hopefully you will be a little bit more familiar with them afterwards. Uh, but these ones, particularly these top ones, are some really nice places to go away and find them. You can typically find them online. I'll show you an example of how they look. And the example I'm looking at is these subway tiles here. An example of the files that might be within that. And then we're going to talk about what those are um, and what they might be named differently and how we use them, of course, most importantly. So um, in uh, Enscape, you've, we've seen the material editor. There are three types of maps that we can load in. There are some other ones, but they're probably outside of the scope of this talk today. But these are the ones that are going to have the biggest, biggest impact for you. These are called albedo, height and uh, reflections. So inside of the file that we uh, might download from a website, so this is one from cco-textures.com. This is uh, how it looks. So you can come on here and search for them. And we've got a few options between having JPEG versions of the files or PNG versions of the files in different resolutions. You download one of those and inside that file are a few different images. So we have, uh, in this example, this one had uh, something called ambient occlusion.jpg. If we see ambient occlusion, or sometimes it's abbreviated to AO, uh, we don't need this. Enscape doesn't support this one, so ignore it. Uh, we'll have another one called color, we'll have another one called displacement, another one called normal, uh, another one called roughness. And there are some variations on this, but let's have a look at um, those maps one by one. So albedo, that is the main texture or colour of your object. This might be what you would look at and say, right, that's a SketchUp texture. I'm going to apply it to a wall or whatever. And you can see, and you can see there we've got the colour of the tile and the colour of the grout uh, in the tile as well. Of course, different coloured grout to the tile. This, depending on which source you get it from, this might be called an albedo map, it might be called a colour map, it might be called a base colour, or it might be called a diffuse colour, or some variation of those. So if you see any of those names or something abbreviated, then this is what we were looking at. It's usually fairly it's usually fairly obvious that that's the one that you want for albedo, as it looks like the thing that you're actually getting. So let's have a look at the next one. Uh, and this is a normal map, so I'm just going to have a sip of water. Okay. So we're looking at the height section of uh, the Enscape PBR maps, and this is going to be doing some real heavy lifting um, for our model. Um, this is a height map called a normal map, actually, and this is really easily found because it's always this purpley blue color. It's fairly easy to look at and be able to read because uh, it kind of looks like an embossed image. It almost has a slight 3D property. So we can kind of see now that my tiles um, are going to have some extra information in them that will make them look closer to a subway tile with these with these bevels on them. And this is an illusion of depth. Um, these uh, This information contained within here is going to instruct Enscape to basically show light as if it's hitting these edges in different ways, uh, even though there's not actually any geometry there. So it's a trick of the eye. And I was trying to think of a number for this, but I think um, to just give you an idea, these work really well for very small, um, small texture detail. So anything under two millimeters in, in height, I suppose. So that could be something really tiny. That could be the, if it was a human's face, it could be the pores in their skin. It could be, um, if it's on a wood, it could be the wood grain as a texture. It could be a very shallow tile, maybe the difference just between um, the edge of the tile and the grout line. So this is suitable for very, very small, fine details. We'll have a look at the difference. When we actually load this one in, it gives us three options. Uh, there's three different types of maps. So sometimes you have to load it in and choose the most appropriate map, which for this case would be the normal map. Sometimes it will get it right. It will pick it. Other times it won't. The other kind of map that we can use for height is called a displacement map. And this is um, very, very useful in other situations. Uh, this maybe doesn't look as easy to read, but if you want to know what it is, it's always black and white. Black is information that's kind of going inwards, so downwards, if we're talking about height, and white represents uh, something that's leaping out of the texture. And using a combination of 
the grayscale colors, we can create um, actual real looking 3D geometry. This is really good for creating very deep, um, deep detail. It's a little bit more computationally expensive, um, so we only use this in situations where it is really needed. Occasionally you'll see something called a bump map. Um, this is also another black and white one. Generally when people talk about bump maps, they are actually talking about something that's quite old fashioned, and this is an older version of a normal map. So we generally don't need to use the bump map section, uh, bump map option, um, but it is useful to know that sometimes they label it the bump map and it's actually the displacement map. So sometimes you just have to give it a try and see if it works for you. The final map that we'll look at in a moment is a roughness map and a roughness map uh, what this does is this changes the roughness on a more local level so we've been changing roughness across a whole texture making everything shiny or everything reflect uh, or everything rough and this allows us to define which parts of a texture uh, are shiny or rough so in this case the tile is black and that represents a, a low roughness value so shiny and the white represents a high roughness value. So the grout is not reflective. And then we've got these little gray bits on here, which are some just surface variations. So this might be um, just some smudges or some dirt or something else that, that is just interacting with the light in a different way. And this can, again, just add some extra realism into our image. I know often when we're creating CG renders, you might not necessarily want to think about there being dirt or smudges in your uh, perfect world, but those Real life things exist everywhere, uh, even in a brand new, you know, brand new show home. There is some natural uh, grunge hidden away, and these all contribute towards making things look more real. Uh, we'll see how this looks in just a second. So, some tips for material maps. If you've got the choice, PNG or TIFF files will generally produce better results, particularly for our normal map and our height map. Other things to know higher resolution maps or using more maps you'll need a more powerful machine to do it so things uh, in Enscape are starting to slow down it may be that you've just got a lot of these um, in your model and in order to kind of combat that and just be sensible and optimize your model in a sensible way if you've got the choice to download different resolutions of files which I think I did in this example here I would generally start with the lower resolution ones to the 1k the 2k start with those see how you go if those look good in your model brilliant if you're finding those ones look a little bit blurry or whatever, then those are the times when we can go and get the higher resolution versions of them. Uh, right, so I've lost my, uh, I've got two material. Okay, so let's uh, have a look at these in uh, actually working in Enscape now. Right, let's go um, upstairs for this. First of all, let's have a look at something uh, something obvious let's look at the floor so in order to apply these I'm just going to go into my materials editor and I've actually already got a texture here but what I'm going to do I'm going to go away and find the albedo texture so I can either delete the one that's there and click plus or click on the name itself and that would give me the option so I'm going to look at um, that subway tile which is here we see these folders and I'm going to load in this one. In this example, it's labeled as color. I'm going to load that one in and we can see down here, we've now got tiles. They're actually a little bit smaller than I would like them to be. So I'm going to come over into Enscape. You can, you could do this actually in SketchUp. You can change your um, parameters here or we can do it in Enscape. And I'm going to hit um, explicit texture transformation and I'm just going to change these numbers to one and one in this example, which will just scale them up to make them a little bit easier for you guys to see. So here we are. We can see uh, we've now got, you know, something that's meant to represent tiles if they were shiny. We can see them there. Let's load in next our roughness map to give you an example of what that does. So if we pay attention to here, uh, load in the roughness map. As we move around, hopefully you can see this, that the those grout lines are no longer reflecting light. So even off in the distance there, we've already got a little bit of extra depth or realism just, just from making the grout itself uh, not be able to reflect light back. 
sometimes that alone can be really powerful and make a huge difference to, to the model. But in this case here, we've still got something that looks like uh, it's uh, very flat. So let's load in a height map. So I'm going to load in the normal map to begin with. And what you can see now is we have started to get um, an effect of some height. Now, it's selected normal map for this one, which is good, so I'm going to just make sure it's there. And then we've got an option here for intensity, and that's going to increase the or amplify the effect of this, of this normal map. And we can see, yeah, we've got a kind of bevel there off in the distance. That looks all right, actually. We can see it there. But maybe if we were in a scene where we were very close to something, you might re realize that there is some there is a kind of level of fakery happening here. Um, you can see as we've amplified it as well, you can see there are some kind of surface imperfections in it as well. And this is, again, a desirable thing because it this exists in, in real life. Those tiles probably aren't that perfect, but we have amplified, the I guess, the any imperfections that exist within the file as well. So you can see that there. Let's have a look at how this would look at, uh, how this would look with the displacement map. So I'm just going to swap it out for displacement, which as we said, is a different kind of bump map. Oh, it's loaded in as a bump map to begin with, which is which is wrong. Uh, but you can see how it kind of worked. Let's turn it down to almost zero to get full effect. Um, let's change it to the displacement map. And then we can see as we increase the displacement, we can see that we're starting to get the perception of real height. So there we go, we can see actually if I exaggerate it quite a lot, we can see the, the different type of effect that the displacement map can provide. Now I think by the time that I get that to kind of real, hmm, realistic looking tile level, I don't think I look a million miles off that original normal map that I had. So I'm gonna go back to using that for this example because it will perform better. And I've broken it. Oh yeah, because it needs to be changed to normal map. There we go. So I'm going to go with that one there. So that's an example of um, just how you can load in just three textures and it can make a really big difference. Let's head over to a wall and look at another type of thing that we see a lot. And that is, uh, I guess, like a kind of plaster wall. Uh, 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 I can't think what I'm doing. Brain work, please. There we go. Let's just grab the wall material there. I haven't got a material on that wall. Well, there we go. That's my uh, preparation failing. Let's just apply uh, anything for now. Uh, something I haven't used. Let's use that one. I'm just going to make that uh, make that white. There we go. Right. <laughs> Sorry about that. So let's have a look at this wall here, and let's look at how we can use um, use a height map to add some texture to what we might think as being otherwise quite a, a plain flat surface. All of, everything we see has some kind of texture on it, which is why the roughness and uh, the roughness slide itself isn't enough to create coarser substances. So if you think about uh, a, a painted wall, whether it's been painted with a roller or a brush, you've still got you know, you've still got a surface that you can feel with your fingernail. You can get close, you can see the, uh, if I've painted it, you can see the bits of hair that have fallen off the roller. <laughs> you can see the brush marks, you can see all those things. Um, so let's load in, um, in this example, we'll show you with a coloured wall. Let's say we've got that salmon pink wall, for example. Um, I can load in a colour map. So I think I've got another one for plaster. I got saved somewhere. Nope. Gray plaster. Let's have a look at that. Um, so this is this is this is called gray plaster, and this is probably a good example because it's maybe not what we want for the wall. Um, first of all, we can see that it's tiled a lot. That texture, it's like a photo texture of of plaster, um, and the tiling is quite obvious. So I'm going to make it larger to try and make that um, tiling less obvious. Uh, in fact, we'll go for two on that one. Okay, so we've now got a, a photo texture. So I'm just going to change that light to get it out of the way. So we've now got a photo texture of tile, and this probably isn't what you want. Um, I don't really want this filthy, um, gross looking wall in my lovely coffee shop. Um, <laughs> but what we can do is we can use the other components of this material that I got from online. So I'm going to grab my height map, 
And this here is, we'll just use the normal map again for this one, so we'll load that one. Because we're just talking about very fine details, that is probably all we need. Just so we can see it, I'm going to turn it all the way up to 100. I'm going to grab my roughness map, which I also happen to have, uh, and I'm going to put that on anyway. Now, in this example, we can't really see a great deal going on, but let's show you as light changes and as light falls across this at different angles, we get close enough. Have I got the right file? I feel like I've done something wrong. Uh, do, 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 normal. Let's turn off. Oh, there we go. We can see it more easily. There we go. So I've actually got. So using this option here, image fade, I've actually faded out the um, the photo texture that's kind of come with this file because I don't really want it. You'd fade it all the way out, or you could leave a little bit of it behind just to add some some variation. And we can see now that we've got a surface that is a little bit a little bit pitted, and depending on how the light catches it, it's actually able to cast shadows on itself so I'm going to swap this for a different one because this actually isn't <laughs> this isn't obvious enough to see on a on a stream uh, I do have another one let's use white plaster I'm sure that's the one I'm looking for and kind of see it going on up here so we've actually got some texture that's been provided by by the height map and if it is severe enough it will actually be able to cast shadows onto itself into those little into those little divots um, if we find that we don't really want them to be quite so obvious we can just decrease the intensity of that um, so let's just go to about there and that's again very fine fine detail probably at this distance here is not particularly perceptible but this all adds real uh, what's the word I'm looking for this adds to the way that the light bounces around the model so in certain lighting conditions we will see this we will see that this is now a a rougher surface it should hopefully look a lot better than if we'd have just left that blank let's show some other creative uses for height maps um, so let's just come over here. What are we on four o'clock? So I'm just going to do a couple of a couple more examples. These are really, as I said, these are really powerful. Uh, if I've actually loaded up the right file, which I'm worried I haven't done now, we can see in my model here actually these pebbles here. Uh, these are actually produced uh, from a PBR map that I've downloaded from one of the sites I provided you with, and these are, have created some actual real real looking pebbles that can actually receive light and cast shadows and behave in a, in a natural way. So otherwise that would be a, uh, that would be a flat, a flat texture. Uh, let's go back to that. Sorry, just get it all up in sync again. Yeah, just to uh, show you that. That is actually a flat texture. So we can have a really big impact on, on certain types of material. Let's show you another really good example here of the floor. I'm going to speed up now. Um, this is a material that I got from one of these websites, Paving Stones 046. And let's look at how we can apply this and the kind of effect that we can have. So let's grab paving stones, which is definitely got in the right place. Ooh, now. We've got this one, it's got colour, it's called. Nope. Uh, we're gonna do uh, we'll do gets let's pass some light on it first of all. So let's see the roughness map working. So the roughness map's gonna define whether it's you know shiny or not. You, of course, can opt out of using the roughness map if you want. If you find that sometimes the material can look too shiny or too rough, just depending on how the person who has authored the material has made it look. Um, 
in which case you can delete it and then use those manual controls and, and usually that's okay if you've got a, a height map. We can see here now that just, just controlling that the cement or the mortar is non-reflective and the stones are reflective, we can see that that in itself has added a good amount of realism. If we use a height map, we'll use the normal map to begin with and we can see uh, it hasn't selected normal map, so I'm going to turn on the normal map. We can see, if I again increase the intensity of it to exaggerate it for you, we can see that the combination of that optical illusion of the height and the reflection map has now created a, a quite natural looking stone with natural variation. Natural variation in the texture itself, but then my model, because light is bouncing around it from different places, it's creating a natural variation over quite a large area, which is really beneficial to creating something natural looking. Um, but if we wanted to go real big with um, our detail, which I probably would do in, um, in some cobbles, I can load the displacement map again, and you can see there that we've just got a greater deal of control over the, the depth of those tiles or those cobbles. So I would probably opt to use this one on this. And this looks really good. So that's, yeah, a few examples of, um, of PBR maps. So, so you can, again, use those creatively. This is, uh, this is actually one. This looks like real geometry. This is uh, a terracotta stone wall, but in fact, it actually was a flat surface with a displacement map. And there's lots of really awesome things you can get that uh, can really help you to either communicate something that you want to communicate that, uh, so in this case here, maybe I want to try and uh, go for something a little bit more opulent on this wall. That's Turn this on, uh, and escape. Where have you gone? Hello. Uh, let's try loading in another kind of <laughs> showstopper style uh, map. Let's do metal. Or metal tiles. Metal tiles base color. We've now got these kind of honeycomb tiles, which are tiny. Let me make those bigger. Four and four. Let's do that. Let's tell Enscape that it's made of metal. Okay, we've now got a kind of quite rough metal. Let's make them shiny. Let's load in roughness map, uh, which is called uh, roughness. We can now see that some of it's reflecting light, some of it isn't. And then let's add our height map to this. So I've got a really good height map or displacement map that they've called a height map. So sometimes you just have to try it and see if it works. Let's set it to a displacement map. A little bit exaggerated, but we can see how we've now really, really quickly changed a really l large surface um, and Enscape's calculating all the reflections really accurately. And this is going to have an impact across the whole model. So I think that is probably about time. Um, I'm at an hour already, or well, just over an hour. Um, so Hopefully, that's given you an idea of some of the things that you can achieve with um, with those maps that you've gone and found online, or just with keywords, or with those um, manual parameter changes. So I think that is me there. Let's see if we've got any questions. Uh, my colleague Lauren, who's our marketing manager here at Elmtech, is also with me. So maybe she could uh, have a look at some questions and let me know what we've got. Hey Adam, hey everyone. Um, fantastic webinar, thank you. We have a couple. Um, I think Kyle and I have managed to uh, get through most of them while you were presenting. Um, there is one here that I'd like to go back to. I think it needs a, a little bit more demonstration. That's from Lynn. Um, and she's asking, um, where do you add where the light source comes from? Um, I believe it was at sort of halfway point of your presentation. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have explained that it is kind of a simple case of dropping the light source, just a drag and drop, and you can change the light direction and intensity. But um, maybe you could show that a bit clearer. Yeah, so, yeah, so I, I suppose it just depends a little bit on uh, on what the question is, but we'll just cover both both parts of that. So. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so you'll see in, in SketchUp view at the moment, um, if you're familiar with lighting in, in Enscape, you drop in a light source in a, in a very particular way. That's just uh, a bit of a tricky one to arrange. Uh, let me rotate it. One sec. We create this little light light cone. Oh, sorry, I've got too many things open now. Um, so we have our actual oh, our actual physical light source that we can position within within SketchUp. That'll do. <laughs> Get the idea. Uh, and that and that is represented by in this example this little this little cone. Um, let's open that again. And if we and that is that is illuminating the wall in that example there. So I didn't actually have any of those objects placed in the model. Um, all I was getting at was that um, it basically looks a little bit weird if you've got a spotlight and you've got loads of ceiling lights and you've got light bulbs and things in your model and uh, you haven't got a visible place that it's coming from. So if I look at this one here, uh, my brain is starting to slow down. I've got this bar over my SketchUp bar. <laughs> okay. uh, so what I did in, in this example here um, is this model uh, of a light, which we'll go, I'll go right into. Um, I just found a surface within, within the front of that spotlight and using my Enscape tools, select the material that sits on the front, which might have been a glass material to begin with, but um, I've made that a self-illuminating surface. So you can see there that I've turned them all off now. We've got a spotlight shining on my Armtech sign, but we've got no lights that are on. So, you know, it looks a bit weird. Uh, and that's because there's, there's different types of light source that exist within a rendering engine here. So all I've done there was used, used the um, self-illumination option just to give all of those spotlights, which are, look like they've been made right, so they've been made as, as components, so they're all behaving at the same time, just to create a, uh, a point from which that light is, is being emitted. Uh, so the actual lighting things of using the light objects is, is uh, not a material thing, so I've not covered that today, but this is just, just about making sure we, we can see the light coming from something, as it will look a little bit weird otherwise. So I'm hoping that that little demo there answers that question, Lynn. Um, if it doesn't, feel free to send me an email and uh, tell me again, and I'll try again. Are there any other ones? Um, I don't think there are, actually. We, uh, we managed to uh, fire through them while you were presenting. Um, yeah, one more just yeah, uh, yeah we've, uh, we haven't got any more. We'll maybe give it two more minutes um, if anyone thinks yeah. of anything um, or there. So totally welcome to email us. Email us. Sure. I'm just flicking through. So James has asked what spec of computer am I using? So I've got um, an HP laptop with a an NVIDIA RTX Quadro 4000, I think it is, which has eight gigabytes of video memory, 30, 32 gigs of uh, system memory. Um, what else have we got there? So... Yeah, I think just questions about the materials. So yeah, Enscape doesn't have any built-in materials. That's why we've gone off to those other websites. And light sources. Oh, we've got... Yeah, some other ones at the bottom here. We've got one just coming. Um, this is from Lundina. Hi, Lundina. Um, asking, is the water in the pool just a layer over the water material, or is it a solid form inside the pool? Yeah, so if that makes it does make sense, and it is actually the former <laughs> so it is a, a layer that's sitting on top of the pool technically um if i go into it you can see there i'm not there's no water here <laughs> and if i look out it's single-sided so there's nothing there but enscape is very clever and it has um tried to work out where the bottom of my pool is. So the core sticks are being cast onto the bottom of it. And there is also a depth component when viewed from above. So the deeper the water, the darker it will become. So technically, yeah, it's just on the top, <laughs> but in reality, it will look like it has depth. Got it, cool. Um, yeah, 
not a question, but uh, Richard says that was excellent. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, Thank oh, one more question here we've got from Yab. Can Adam please repeat the graphic spec of your laptop, please? So it's the, for, for Enscape and I think any kind of 3D rendering. Um, Sorry, just watching another video. I think the kind of one of the main components you need to look at if you're doing any kind of 3D rendering nowadays, particularly if it's a real-time render like Enscape, is the graphics card. And I've got, a, I think it's a Quadro 4000 that I have inside my laptop, which is um, an NVIDIA ray tracing capable uh, workstation card. Um, generally, if you're looking at laptops, if you've got something that's got an NVIDIA card, in particular an NVIDIA RTX card, usually the rest of the specs on that computer that surround that uh, are kind of capable for running uh, good quality real time visualizations or or games if you if you want to do that too um so there's a few questions I've got one more yeah just read it out and i think it might be related to that as well um just also to let you know guys um, feel free to drop us an email um for any questions regarding the graphics parts or the graphics yeah. as well we can help out on that too um Question from Graham. Uh, Escape looks a lot smoother and less grainy around the edges in the YouTube videos I've seen compared to how it looks here. Why is that? Right. The reason that I think this is happening is you can probably see it's just beavering away and calculating as I, as I stop. Um, my computer, I'm having to render, I'm having to record some things in the background. My audio processing is actually using my graphics card. Uh, so basically my, my laptop's working much harder than it normally would do. And I think he's right. It does look grainy than it normally does for me when I'm actually working on things. So I think it's just that my computer's under a really heavy load right now. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I think that's all it is. <laughs> computer needs a pay rise it's it does a yeah it hasn't and it hasn't crashed which is good it crashed it crashed during rehearsals so yeah, it's not crashed today sure. <laughs> but for sure Graham, you are correct like it will look uh smoother if you're not yeah. running a webinar at the same time and what <laughs> what you may have seen as well um is that Enscape has it, it does something called rest mode so when i actually so when i'm moving it's recalculating everything in real time but when i actually stop it sits down and it just calculates the space that I'm looking at. So that might be what you're also seeing. Is it just as I'm moving, the quality is reduced? But um, yeah, but it still it still applies. My computer is probably working too hard. Uh, so I think I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I think in terms of other bits of questions, there yes, there is a, there is a free trial for Enscape, um, and also for those who don't um, already have a subscription for Enscape, we'll be sending out a. Uh, a link to be able to get some some discount for 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 Enscape as well. So yeah, I think that's all all I needed to do. Thanks so much for everybody who stuck around to the end. It's really appreciated. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll email you with some bits and pieces, some cheat sheets, and some other info that kind of supports this webinar. And as I've said, feel free to to drop me an email, ask me any questions that you have. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time.